space, please. You can go. Okay, thanks. Well, welcome back, everyone. Let's hope for a smoother day today with no, no fire alarms. Um, okay, so I spoke a lot about oh, uh, slow roll inflation yesterday, and the workshop or the tutorial you've just been in with Pepper was about that. And I'll proceed to a topic which really goes beyond any textbook on cosmology or inflation that I'm aware of, which is the topic of ultra slow roll inflation. So I'm going to go a bit slower today, uh, assuming that essentially nobody is familiar with this topic. Uh, as always, I encourage you to please ask questions using the sound. Um, yeah, because, you know, I won't be checking the chat all of the time. And so since this is not a, yeah, not a topic in textbooks, I've given two references, one by Kostas Demopoulos from 2017 called Ultra Slow Roll Inflation Demystified, which is about the background evolution of ultra slow rolls, so the behavior of the inflaton field at the homogeneous and isotropic level. Then I reference a second paper by myself by uh, Pippa Cole, who you just met in the tutorial, plus a Patil, more recent one. And these are the archive numbers. And this one is specifically about the link to primordial black holes. The first one is more just the general uh, background of ultra slow roll. And for today, we'll focus on background. And, oh, can everyone please mute their microphones unless asking a question? Okay, so today I'll just be talking about uh, ultra slow roll inflation. We'll make the link to primordial black holes tomorrow and more on Thursday. Good, so these equations have survived the Friedman fluid and acceleration equation. And I've also written four key equations for inflation. So the density or the energy density, the pressure, um, the equation of motion. This is really key phi double dot plus 3h phi dot plus. P prime, and remember phi dot, a dot means derivative with respect to um, cosmic time t, a prime means a derivative with respect to the field phi. As you should have seen when you were taking um, the slow roll parameters for the, the potential in a half m squared phi squared. Okay, you took the derivative with respect to phi. Um, and we've got here the Friedman equation written in a flat universe because inflation makes the universe spatially flat very quickly. Um, it's simply the energy density rho, which is the potential plus the kinetic energies. Okay, so if we go back to um, this really super important equation uh, for a field in a expanding background, hence it's a function of h, because uh, the expansion acts like a friction term plus dv by d phi, just writing it explicitly as zero. Okay, so in slow roll, the field is rolling slowly, and hence, because the field is rolling slowly, and it stays rolling slowly, we can drop the acceleration term phi double dot. That's how it's normally explained, and that is normally correct, but it's not quite that simple. And um, because what happens if your potential is it? not just quite flat, or like slow roll flat, but extremely flat, what happens if it's exactly flat? Then this term can become zero. Okay. Now, if this term goes to zero, then even though the field is not going to start rolling quickly, if there's no derivative, it's nonetheless wrong to neglect this term in favor of this term when this term becomes too small. So a slow roll can break down, actually, because the potential is too flat. So a slow roll moment is not always valid. Well, I, should, I was going to say correct, but that's not really the point. It's, it's not always a valid or a good approximation. And especially, we're going to study the case where v prime equals 0. Or alternatively, where it's sufficiently close to zero <laughs> that we have to neglect this term. Um, okay. So if d prime is equal to zero, then it's clear, right? We have to drop this term 
goes to zero. So now we've got a new equation of motion, um, also a simple one. Just as it was simple in slow roll when we dropped this, we had a first order. We're now going to have a second order, but a um, relatively simple one. Phi double dot plus 3h phi dot plus 0. Now what does that mean? Well, if you think about the slow roll solution, um, okay, slow roll would imply that um, 3h phi dot is minus v prime, which is equal to zero. Okay, so slow roll would imply that the infoton field has stopped, phi dot is equal to zero. And that is a valid solution, but that's only a valid solution if your initial condition is consistent with that, meaning if the field wasn't rolling to begin with. And then you have a real problem, because if the field's not rolling at all, that means it's stuck, and there's no derivative of the potential, your field is stuck. So if you look at the, the Friedman equation, with zero kinetic energy, the field never rolls, you've got potential energy. This doesn't mean the end of inflation, not at all, it rather means eternal inflation with a cosmological constant, at least at the classical background level, it's exactly the same as a cosmological constant. Okay, so this would imply H equals constant forever, at least forever into the future, which is called eternal inflation. And eternal inflation, it's a very cool concept, the idea that the universe expands exponentially forever, and Alan Guth called it the ultimate free lunch. But it's got nothing to do with our universe in the sense that we've clearly, you know, we're clearly not taking part in eternal inflation. Inflation had to end, we then had radiation domination. Um, so this didn't happen. The field, if the field experienced a part where the derivative of the potential went to zero, the field was still rolling. Oh, sorry, the projector may be in the way. Okay. So what can we do? Well, what we can do is simply solve this equation as a function of some unknown, unknown but non-zero initial um, derivative. So the field is rolling. The idea is that we are rolling down some potential, then we hit a flat point, but we still have kinetic energy. Okay, so let's just solve this equation. Um, the way to do that then is to see, well, it's a second order, but everything's in terms of phi dot or phi double dot, so if we let v equal phi dot, okay, then we can rewrite this equation as v dot plus 3h, v is equal to zero. Okay. So we can solve this by rearranging, um, so we have the integral of um, v dot over v is minus 3, and remember what h is. h is simply a dot over a. So we've got the integral a dot over a. And these are integrals we can solve. Okay, so this gives you log v is proportional to minus 3 log a. Then exponentiate everything. Remember that log minus 3 log a is log of a to the minus 3. So what we see is that um, phi dot, which, was, which is equal to v, and it's proportional to a to the minus 3. And in terms of e-folding number, which again is sort of the most natural and convenient way to parameterize the duration of inflation. It's not exactly time, but it's equivalent to a time coordinate. And uh, this is e to the sorry, e to the minus three n. Okay. So why is ultra slow roll inflation given that name? Well, it's because phi dot is decreasing very, very rapidly, exponentially with a number of e folds. Hence the name. Um, so, right, if given this, it's trivial to see that the kinetic energy, which is proportional to phi dot squared, okay, is proportional to a to the minus 6. So, the kinetic energy very, very quickly goes to zero. 
So we're still allowed to drop the kinetic energy from the Friedman equation, and we do have, right, we do have h is very close to constant. But nonetheless, it is not a good approximation to treat phi as constant. Although phi moves very little, very slowly, phi dot is a very important parameter. Phi dot changes, you know, is not constant. Phi dot is changing very, very rapidly. And that's very important. So the potential energy dominates completely, well, almost completely, but phi dot is going to be a key parameter. So what's going on? Well, remember epsilon h, which you've just been looking at, this was minus h dot, over h squared. When h is approximately constant, sorry, I'm writing a bit small here. This is proportional to phi dot squared. Remember, this was proportional to the kinetic energy over the potential energy. Potential energy we can treat as constant, kinetic energy we cannot. So this thing is proportional a to the minus 6. Um, so this thing, which has to be smaller than 1 in order for inflation to happen at all, is very, very quickly, within a couple of b foldings, driven exponentially close to 0. So ultra-slow roll, just like slow roll, still implies that the epsilon slow roll parameter is very small. But unlike Okay, so this is true for ultra slow roll, but the big difference from slow roll SR inflation is epsilon h varies rapidly. Okay, so that's important. In slow roll, epsilon h is very small and constant. In ultra-slow roll, epsilon h is very small, but changes very rapidly as well. It decreases very rapidly. Um, so now we need a, a way to parameterize how quickly epsilon h changes, which is a way of also parameterizing the kinetic energy or phi dot. And I'm going to introduce a second slow roll parameter. Okay. Except it's not really a slow roll parameter, it's a second, um, it's still what we call the second slow roll parameter. Yeah. Although we'll see it's often not small, um, which is eta. Some people call it epsilon subscript 2, um, some call it delta. I'm going to call it eta, but beware, some people use eta for conformal time instead, so, you know, that's just how it is. Eta epsilon dot over h epsilon. Now, it's quite straightforward to see, remembering that n, that e folding number is h times t, you can rewrite this h dot as the epsilon by dn. Uh, that swallows up this 1 over h factor here, so divided by epsilon, using again h ht is equal to the e folding number n in the limit of constant h, but that's a very, very good approximation. Again, remember, phi dot squared is going exponentially close to zero, so we're just left with v of phi, and that's going to change extremely slowly because the inflaton field is moving extremely slowly. Well, we can see very easily from up here, e to the minus 6 goes like e to the minus 6n. Um, so during um, ultra slow roll, eta, which is the time derivative in effective units of epsilon, is minus 6. It's not close to 0. But remember, epsilon h is still much, much less than 1. Whilst during um, slow roll, 
eta, which is a time derivative again of epsilon, in fact is uh, very close to zero. It can be of order epsilon or even smaller, but eta is much, much less than one, and epsilon h, which is approximately epsilon v, is also much, much less than one. Okay. So this is the key thing. Eta, meaning that variation of epsilon can be very fast in inflation, but not in slow roll inflation, only in what's called ultra slow roll inflation. So I'll, I'll draw one quick plot and then see if there are any questions, which is just to give an idea of how we might imagine the field evolution now, and the potential. So the idea is we might have um, slow roll inflation where potential is moving, then you may have something like an inflection point or a small shoulder. It can't be very wide, we'll soon understand why. And and then you continue. Okay. So it's this. It's sort of between here where you've got ultra slow roll. For the rest, you've got slow roll over here and slow roll over here. When you have ultra slow roll, the derivative of the potential will be too small to see by R. It's really incredibly close to flat. Um, and so here, Phi dot is decreasing very rapidly. Here, phi dot, it's still small, but it's approximately constant. Then it decreases exponentially. And then in order to get back to slow roll, it has to speed up again. And then it reaches the slow roll attractor again. Remember, the slow roll attractor is where you can drop phi double dot. OK, so are there any questions before I continue? Uh, can I ask a question? Uh, for sure. So this ultra slow roll will only be uh, needed to take in to be taken into account for a certain kind of potentials. Correct. Okay. And also, uh, you mentioned before this um, eternal inflation. Mm -hmm. we, I mean, we obviously know that uh, inflation has to end, so we cannot have eternal inflation into the future. But actually, nothing forbids to have eternal inflation into the past, right? Um, I actually think that is a problem, but not for any reason, anything to do with what I've said. Um, I think it's somehow inconsistent, as far as we understand, at least within GR, to have an eternal universe to the past, uh, within the standard sort of energy conservation equations of GR. But you're right, observationally at least, and indeed we don't know the, you know, the equations at the at the limit of the Planck energy, there's nothing observationally to stop us having exited from internal inflation, meaning that inflation could still be going on in unobservably far away parts of the universe, and we've simply left it. So that's possible, yes. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, yes, another question. Uh, why do we want the potential to have an inflection point? Why do we want the ultra solar roll? In well, it, in order to generate primordial black holes is the answer for this course. Um, ah, okay. In general, it's just a fact that if you have an inflection point, and you know some potentials do, and um, then you have to be very careful how you treat inflation around that point, because normally we assume ultra, sorry, normally we assume slow roll, we drop phi double dots. And that's correct, but it's not correct if V prime goes to zero. And so then whether or not you want primordial black holes, you have to check that inflation successfully crosses the inflection point. And you can't do that without dropping the slow roll approximation. But I'm not saying this is generic. There are lots of potentials like the M squared phi squared, which doesn't have an inflection point. Okay, thanks. Okay. Good. So, yeah, these are good questions. So, indeed, yeah, if there's an inflection point, then we go into ultra slow roll for some duration. Um, but then we have to worry about what happens to the fluctuations. So, 
So if you remember uh, the perturbation sound, which of course are important, as I said, that's really the main reason why people study inflation today. It's to study the statistical properties of the perturbations from inflation. Well, I gave you this result piece of curly R was h squared over, I don't remember the name, I find it's 8 pi squared m blank squared epsilon. Now, this was for slow roll inflation, and very non trivially, this more or less remains true, but not quite. This remains somewhat true for some regimes also in ultra slow rolls, but not for all the scales. So, this is, let me say, yeah. sometimes okay in ultra slow roll, but only for some scales. And it's very important to realize that. In ultra slow roll, um, epsilon h is not approximately equal to epsilon v. Okay. Because remember, if v prime is zero, epsilon v would imply epsilon v is precisely equal to zero. Not just close to zero, which is slow roll, but precisely zero. So it's then essential that you apply the epsilon parameter, you cannot say, well, it's, you know, epsilon, which is epsilon h or epsilon v, you're free to choose the convenient definition. Here you have to choose the definition epsilon h. And that is the one which came from the relation between r and uh, delta phi between the curvature perturbation, right here, curly r, h over phi dot delta phi. Okay, so this is the epsilon h definition, not the epsilon v. And they're only equivalent in slow roll. Yeah. But still, I give the caveat. This is only roughly true. It gives sort of order of magnitudes for certain scales. It's... And you also then have to be very careful that this thing now evolves rapidly. So it becomes important. When do we evaluate? You can't just evaluate at a horizon crossing. So you need to evaluate. Uh, epsilon h, not epsilon v, and after ultra slow roll. And even then, it's actually not very accurate. But it's good enough for us to build a little bit of intuition. So we can't just use uh, horizon exit. Um, there's a lot of, let's say, additional challenges when dealing with ultra slow roll as opposed to slow roll, both at the level of the background and at the level of the perturbations. So if you recall that as I show you, um, I want you to be able to see the formula. So epsilon h is proportional to um, e to the minus 6n during ultra slow roll. Well, then right, the power spectrum of r will grow because h squared is constant, or very, very close to constant, like e to the 6n. So the power spectrum becomes very large because phi dot becomes very small, as you can see very simply from this relation between the curvature perturbation and delta phi. Delta phi is of order h. Okay. So this thing is of order h squared over phi dot, which is proportional to 1 over phi dot. Simple as that. In the sense that h squared is nearly constant. We don't know the value of h, but we know it's changing slowly. So now we have, you know, we have this relation now. And as I say, you know, it's derived in hand wave away, it's not fully correct, but it's nonetheless true that the perturbations do grow exponentially during ultra slow roll. And here we may have a problem, which is, well, two problems. One is that when 
when r becomes order one, then perturbation theory is breaking down. Everything I've done assumed the cosmological perturbations are small, that may stop being true. And in fact, it might not take very long of, during ultra slow roll for the perturbations to become large. So this is breakdown of perturbation theory, but this also implies, of course, that at the power spectrum is order one, and this leads to again internal internal inflation. I hope you can read this. So when the power spectrum amplitude becomes order unity, to the level you can still trust your calculations at all, and you're moving into the regime of internal inflation. And I'll show in a hand away sense why that is true. Okay, so what's what's going on when this happens? Well, the point is that R becoming one. This implies h over phi dot is becoming very um, very large because phi dot phi dot is very small. And what does very small mean? Well, if you think of what happens during inflation, like down that potential, you have some classical energy at the background level which drives the field down the potential. Now, when you hit a flat point, you quickly lose that kinetic energy. And at some point, there's the risk that the quantum mechanical fluctuations, which are of order, well, delta phi, which is of order h, they make you jump around. They make you jump both back the way you came from and forwards further down the potential. And how far do you roll? Well, phi dot over h, okay? This thing is, again, in terms of e-folding number, which is a better way, I think, to think of how inflation progresses, this is about a delta phi of a delta n. So when we've got r, which is like the square root of the power spectrum of r, remember this was h over the square root of epsilon, h over h squared over um, phi dot, so that's h squared over phi dot over h, okay? So this thing is like delta phi, phi to by capital delta phi over delta n. Okay, so when this thing becomes order unity, so the power spectrum is of order unity, that means that the, um, the quantum mechanical fluctuations, let me just go back to here, right, the fluctuations which can take me up or down by an amount of order h, and become just as important as the classical um, phi dot, the classical kinetic energy. And so if I'm equally likely to jump up or down, and the amount I roll down is less than the amount I'm randomly, 50% of the time, likely to jump upwards, then inflation will never end. Sort of half of the universe will become stuck. Some of it will manage to jump forwards and down, but other parts will jump backwards. And the parts which jump backwards will inflate more, They'll keep inflating, inflation will never end everywhere. Um, so there's a very hand wavy, but in, in fact, basically correct explanation for why the power spectrum becoming order one means, by definition of the curvature perturbation, it means that the quantum fluctuations of order h are, are big enough to be as big as the classical, the kinetic energy rolling you down. And hence, yeah, if you're equally likely to have your background value of the field be closer to the start of inflation as it is further away, then inflation is not going to end. So that is the problem of eternal inflation. Well, that
That is one problem of eternal inflation. And whilst it's true, as, uh, as well as asked in one of the questions, that we could have come out of eternal inflation, um, we certainly don't want the observable scales to get stuck in eternal inflation. That, that's not allowed. So there might have been some inflection point in the far past, which we got out of, but it can't be affecting modes inside today's horizon scale. That's totally ruled out. So let me write down some really key messages about ultra slow roll. So one, be careful when you calculate the power spectrum. You cannot use slow roll approximations um, at all, and even using the formula uh, given is only roughly true. So two, an inflection point can destroy inflation in the sense, well, it doesn't destroy inflation, but it destroys a successful model of inflation because you don't want to get stuck. So the inflaton needs enough kinetic energy to get past the inflection points. If it has too little, if the slow roll initial condition before you try to move into ultra slow roll was too small, you will get stuck, you get trapped, you go into eternal inflation. So you need to pass inflection point and related to the second point and also related to the fact that the power spectrum is growing like e to the 6 okay, so PR with 6n where n this is only true during ultra slow roll so This implies, given that this thing should be less than one, ultra-slow roll cannot last long. And I'll define more carefully, well not define, I'll, I'll derive more carefully how large ultra-slow roll but how long ultra slow roll inflation can last in terms of the ETH holding number. It turns out we're interested in values between two and three, but it cannot be much more, otherwise the power spectrum will become order unity, you'll go into eternal inflation, everything breaks down, linear perturbation theory breaks down, and you know it's a disaster for the universe we live in. Are there any questions quickly before I I move on from those sort of three key points. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Uh, maybe, maybe you told already. Um, why, if the power spectrum becomes of order one, we have eternal inflation? Right. So. Um... Yeah, it's this definition of the curvature perturbation, which, you know, the amplitude is given by the square root of the power spectrum because the power spectrum is R squared. This thing is sort of defined to be, and, but for good reason, which I haven't gone into, h squared over phi dot, which you can rewrite as h divided by phi dot over h. Now, h is the amplitude of the quantum mechanical fluctuations, both for the tensor and the scalar fluctuations. It's the only sort of the relevant mass or energy or length scale, however you want to think about it, during inflation. So h is about the delta phi. Okay, that tells you how far you're being kicked quantum mechanically backwards or forwards. And then you have to compare this value to how far you're rolling down, or how quickly you're rolling down, 
So in one E folding, you roll down an amount delta, capital delta phi. And when the power spectrum becomes order unity, that means your, the amount you roll down is also of order H, meaning your quantum, your quantum mechanical fluctuations are just as important as your background um, you know, kinetic energy. Because the, these are the equations of motion for the background field. Phi is a function of time only. Um, these quantum mechanical fluctuations, they impact, they're, they're spatially dependent as well. Um, and you can't make that splitting anymore where you treat the field as being uh, spatially invariant when the fluctuations become too large. You're jumping around and you're just as likely to jump backwards or forwards. I hope that. Okay, okay. I hope that makes. Well, I mean, it's a difficult thing, you know, I'm, I'm sort of shooting, skipping over the details, but that is basically the correct idea. Okay. So. Get some boards. I'll just say that, you know, how inflation normally leads to scale, nearly square invariant perturbations. And often people say, well, that's clear, sort of H approximately constant implies that the perturbations P R and constant and P, P, approximately constant. It's, we're in something like a um, close to the sitter expansion with a constant Hubble parameter. Now, in slow roll, that happens to be true, uh, but in ultra slow roll, this is not in general true. The tensors still are essentially scale invariant because this thing is proportional to x squared. This thing that was h squared over phi dot, during ultra slow roll, phi dot is changing quickly. And so you have to be much more careful, you know. Now, this thing is always true. Inflation with nearly constant h, quasi the sitter expansion always generates a quasi scale invariant tensor spectrum. This thing is very delicate. It happens to be true for some modes with an extended period of ultra slow roll, even though phi dot is evolving quickly, and that's very non trivial. But in general, um, the scale dependence of the scalar perturbations also requires slow roll. And then we saw it, you know, you've just been looking at this formula, n is minus 1. It's a very important formula, x epsilon v plus 2 e to d. Okay. So when you've got slow roll, these two terms are very small. When you've got ultra slow roll, A they're not well defined and B they're this sort of term, but it's a different e to slow roll parameter can be large. Um, so you have to be careful. You have to be careful also when you evaluate again the power spectrum. It's scale dependent, it's also now time dependent. So PR is a function of k, of the scale, but also of t, which is more complicated. In slow roll, this became independent of time, and I'll show you why uh, soon. It becomes independent of time after horizon exit, so for modes once k is less than ah. It's no longer true for ultra slow roll. So I'm just warning you again that, you know, the, the rules of ultra slow roll inflation are significantly more complicated. And of course, I can't explain everything, but I can give you sort of a flavor of the calculation. By giving just a flavor, what I'm going to do is explain the behavior of the long wavelength limit of the fluctuations, so the so-called super horizon or super Hubble fluctuations. And I'm going to discuss the long wavelength.
Okay, so I've already introduced uh, cosmic time t. We've got e folding, e folds n, which is h times t. Unfortunately, uh, I need to introduce a third, in quotation mark, time variable, conformal time. Now, some people call conformal time eta, but because I'm using eta for my second slow roll parameter, the deviation of epsilon with respect to time, I'm going to call it tau. So I'm going to call um, conformal time uh, tau, which is defined by AD tau is dt. Okay, so conformal time has this factor of the scale factor at the front, and why is that? Well, it's, it's to make the scale factor an overall conformal factor of the Friedmendel and Metro Robertson Walker metric. Um, so let me just very quickly sketch. So you've got ds squared is minus d squared with a negative minus plus 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 signature convention plus a squared so dx squared. This is for a flat, especially flat universe. Now if I rewrite this in terms of conformal time, you can easily see that the scale factor is going to multiply this term as well. So this will become a squared and minus c squared dt. Oh dt d tau squared, sorry, I've used every notation depending on my collaborators, so I might occasionally mix up tau and eta, etc. So minus c squared d tau squared conformal time squared plus the xi squared. Okay. So when you can pull it out the front, in front of everything, this is like a conformal factor. Hence tau is called conformal time. And I've introduced that not because I want to say anything deep and meaningful about conformal time, I don't have anything uh, important to say about it, it's simply that the equations of motion, so-called mode equation for the curvature perturbation, is most conveniently written in terms of conformal time. Okay. So I'm going to be explicit, I've already used dot, I've already used prime, or derivative with respect to n, so I'm now going to be explicit and just write out in full the derivatives what they are. Okay, so the, the mode equation, so called this is for the perturbation, so for r, I'm going to write subscript k just to stop my notation becoming too cluttered. This thing is equivalent to R of K. Okay, and that's because different modes exit and re-enter the horizon at different times. Um, so some will be exiting the horizon, meaning some will have K is equal to AH during slow roll inflation, others will have K equals AH during ultra slow roll inflation. The behavior of those different scales will be very different, depending on how much they're sensitive to the ultra slow roll period. When you're when the infraton field is hitting this inflection point, so I'm certainly not going to try and justify the the mode equation. I'm simply going to give it. So it's a second order again. In cosmology, basically everything's a second order differential equation. The dr k e tau squared. Plus two. Let me define this in a moment. Is there by the tau? Let's be in the RK. Any tau? Okay. So this is our equation. Unfortunately, it is linear in R, but I haven't introduced this z. It's a new variable. Y and z squared 
is 2, scale factor squared, m blank squared, times epsilon h. So again, I'm not pretending to have derived this, I'm simply telling you this is the mode equation, this is the equation of motion for the curvature perturbation during inflation, and this is valid for any form of inflation. It's valid for slow roll, it's valid for ultra slow roll, it's valid for anything in between uh, as well. You simply have to know the evolution of the scale factor and epsilon h, plug that into here, and then if you numerically solve it, you can always find a solution. Uh, analytically, though, it's that's not easy, by the way. And analytically, it's not easy either. Um, in fact, in general, it's impossible to solve this analytically, except in certain regimes. Um, and I'm going to start with one, which is the long wavelength equation. Uh, so I'm going to start in the limit. Remember, long wavelengths, k is inversely related to length. So the super horizon, the very long wavelength limit, k much, much greater than ah. We can take this as being k goes to zero. So we've got a much simpler equation, only valid on large scales, large compared to the Hubble, Kobe and Hubble scale during inflation. Again, k is the inverse of the co-moving length scale. So we can play exactly the same trick as we did before. Now we can let d equals d the r by d tau. Sorry? Yep. Wouldn't it be k much smaller than a times Hubble? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Absolutely, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Welcome. Exactly the wrong way around. Thank you. Thanks very much. Good. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm going to drop this term from the equation. And then we can solve it in a similar way to how we solved for phi dot during ultra slow roll inflation. Okay. So, yeah, we, we do this trick. So, once again, we've now got. From here, we've got that the integral, yeah, a prime over v is minus two integral. Um, well, sorry, yeah, I am going to be sloppy here. And the prime now is uh, uv day tau. Otherwise, it'll just take me too long to. So the algebra, but be careful, this prime is not the same as this prime. And only here I'm going to use prime for d by d tau with conformal time. Tau. So of course we can solve this very easily again. The log v is minus 2 times log z. So v is proportional to, say, to the minus 2. And okay, this is v, remember v prime was dr by d tau. So now I'm going to integrate that and find um, two solutions, right? It's a second order differential equation, so I'd expect to find two uh, integration constants. Second order equation function again. Here was the full equation. We're halfway to the solution, and I'm going to integrate this and plug in the definition of z. And I'm not going to do this very systematically, step by step. Um, but all the steps I skip are hopefully quite reasonably straightforward. Things you can check for yourself. Um, so what we find then is r. K in the limit, K goes to zero. Well, one solution, of course, is just um, R is a constant. Because in the equation of motion, I had no linear term anymore without any time derivative. So this can be a constant. And the 
there's another term dk, which is the integral of here on over z squared. When you apply what the definition is, this is the integral up to some time of a squared epsilon. And now, because I don't want to, you know, I only introduce conformal time as a mathematical convenience, I want to go back to my yeah, cosmic time. I'm just going to rewrite this as C subscript k plus second part d subscript k integral. Well, remember, d tau and dt are related by a factor of a, so the integral of t, d t prime over a cubed epsilon h. And this, this uh, hopefully for many of you will be familiar. The idea that the curvature perturbation and the perturbations freeze out after horizon crossing. So when the k goes to zero limit, um, it goes to a constant. The constant is, of course, a function of when you cross the horizon. It's a function of what the Hubble parameter was, what the slow roll parameters were. But nonetheless, it, it's time independent on large scales. So this is the, the usual constant mode. And this thing, somewhat misleadingly, is called normally the decaying mode. Um, but let me put that in quotation marks, and maybe you can guess why. Can you guess why? Why am I putting this in quotation marks? What's wrong with calling this a decay mode? Does anyone want to hazard, hazard a guess? Um, the clue is, of course, that we are talking about ultra slow roll inflation today, which is not what people normally are thinking about. That in ultra slow roll uh, is that uh, decay. Exactly right. And why is that? Because uh, epsilon is uh, is uh, is so epsilon is decaying, but since it's the inverse is growing. Exactly right. Yeah, thank you. Very good. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, yeah. Hang on. So this one is always constant, and it always exists. Normally, so during um, again during slow roll. Let me be explicit. We have epsilon h is approximately epsilon b, it's approximately constant. So then the d of k term uh, decreases like 1 over a cubed. So it decays incredibly quickly, and that shows you why the perturbations freeze out after horizon or Hubble crossing during inflation, because then you've got a constant plus a very, very rapidly exponentially decaying mode. This implies you've got dk times a to the minus 3, which very rapidly goes to 0. But during, um, during ultra slow roll, right, epsilon h is decreasing like a to the minus 6. So this whole thing, instead of decreasing like a to the minus 3, instead it's going to be growing like um, a to the 3. Let me just say something a bit more general. Um, one can show um, that more generally for constant eta, and it's not difficult to do this, it comes almost directly from the definition of the eta slow roll parameter. I've got epsilon is proportional to a to the eta. Hence, for eta less than or approximately minus 3, well, really less than or equal, and the decaying mode will grow. Hence, the decaying mode, you know, in this special case, it's no longer decaying. Mode. 
And just to be really explicit then, for ultra slow roll, remember what is the value of ultra slow roll? Well, eta then is minus 6, epsilon h proportional to uh, h, um, h to the minus 6, e to the minus 6n. And so in that case, RK, it's dominated by the so-called decaying mode, which goes like integral dt prime over a cubed times a to the 6, proportional to a cubed. Um, maybe actually, maybe a little bit more explicit. Let me use the fact that um, a is proportional to e to the ht during inflation. So this thing is proportional to um, et prime e to the ht prime. Uh, but this is to the power 3, so 3 times this. Again, so when you take the integral, this is simply proportional to e to the 3 ht proportional to a cubed. So this is the solution with the cosmological constant or with a constant h. Now, where did we see this before? Well, remember the power spectrum of R. This is roughly given by up to some numerical factors is R squared. This is proportional to A then cubed squared, so that's A to the 6, as expected. So we've seen some consistency, epsilon h is like a to the minus 6. The power spectrum goes like 1 over epsilon h, okay. which is indeed growing like a to the 6. Good, so I've been talking for an hour. Um, time for a break, for all, everybody's sake. Um, there's less in today's lecture than yesterday, so you know I'm on, I'm well on time. Please feel free to ask questions, and then we'll take a break, and then I'll come back and talk a little bit more about ultra slow roll inflation. Um. Are there any questions? Everybody wants a break, perhaps, which is fine. So maybe shall we come back in ten minutes? Today I'm on time, so I, yeah. As long as the fire alarm doesn't go, we'll we'll finish with a ten minute break. Okay, Chris. Okay. Ten minutes break, and we come back. Yeah. So ten one. 25 past whichever hour time zone you're in. Yeah. I'll see you again. Cool. Okay. And you can write questions in the chat in, during the break if anything comes to, go to mind. Okay. Yeah, Chris, I, I think you can start. Okay, are uh, you recording? Yeah. yeah. Great, cool. Thanks, so yeah, hopefully this time you had time for a proper coffee or an England tea break. Um, so on Thursday I'm going to justify in some detail which amplitude of the primordial power spectrum you need in order to generate an interesting number of primordial black holes. Um, I'm just going to give you the answer for now so we can study, you know, relevant values in the context of ultra slow roll inflation. And it turns out that to get something as gravitationally bound during radiation domination, you need the power spectrum somewhere between 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the minus 2. Um, 
Okay, so wait for Thursday for me to justify this number. But let's just uh, understand a little bit then what are the implications for ultra slow roll inflation? Okay, so we know the amplitude on CMB scales and also a large scale structure is of order 10 to the minus 9. So we need at a minimum six orders of magnitude boost of the power spectrum. You will never get that in slow roll inflation. Um, okay, we need PR to increase by 10 to the 6 or even more. But not by 10 to the 9. We don't want to turn inflation. Okay. So if we recall that we need, um, well, that the power spectrum grows like um, e to the 6 times n ultra slow roll. Okay. It's nice and easy now to solve this. Take the log logarithm, so we've got 6 log 10 is 6 times n ultra slow roll. Okay. 6 is cancelled, so you've got n ultra slow roll. This is to form primordial black holes. It's not a prediction, it's rather a, a requirement for PBH production is that n ultra slow roll is approximately so log 10, which is uh, 2.3 ish e volts. Okay, remember this is a dimensionless quantity. So h times t, well, the difference in time should be 2.3 during ultra slow roll. So we're seeing right that ultra slow roll cannot last very long. This is not, not long. When I say not long, what do I mean? Well, not long, for example, compared to the 50 or 55 or 60 e volts that we expect for the total duration from when that today's horizon scale exited till the end of inflation. So this is, you know, much, much less than 50 to 60, which is not necessarily the total duration, but rather the, the total uh, duration relevant for our observable universe today. And if uh, the power spectrum grew by six orders of magnitude, that means, recall this thing is, goes like a phi log squared. This means that the kinetic energy, well, that, um, sorry, the velocity of the field which is, has decreased, so at the end, at the end ultra slow roll, but n ultra slow roll is 2.3, is 10, point, 10 to the minus 3, so 1 thousandth of the initial. And the initial value will be approximately a constant for most of the slow roll inflation before which is slow roll loop. I got began. Okay, and the kinetic energy is decreased by the inverse of the power spectrum increase, so the kinetic energy is lost a factor of a million. Um, another very simple thing I can show is what happens if you had a bit more, you know, a bit more inflation than that. So what if ultra slow roll inflation lasted not for 2.3 e folds, as were required for PBH production, but I mean, I've worked out the number in advance, what if it was 3.5? Okay, so only an extra, well, what's that, 1.2 e folds of it. Ultra slow roll inflation. Sorry, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah. So you assume that CMB B modes were inside the horizon when the ultra slow roll phase happened, right? Uh, or you have to assume it or not? It's the opposite. I'm assuming they were outside the horizon but, because the horizon is growing. But then they would be boosted during ultra slow roll. And uh, you would see it, no? I'm afraid not, and that, I haven't, yeah, I haven't shown enough to explain that, but um, we have these two modes, right, the constant and the decaying. Yes. 
Now, because when the CMB exits, it well, I'm assuming the CMB exits quite long before ultraslurol. All right. So that um, decaying term really has decayed. It has decayed by a lot. It has decayed uh, by so much that okay, when you okay. have the enhancement of ultraslurol, the enhancement is less than the decay when it came beforehand. I see, I see. Yeah, that uh, makes very sense. Very good question. Okay, thank you. Yeah. The boost only applies to modes which exit during or close to the beginning of ultrasterol, when ultrasterol doesn't last long. So very roughly speaking, if the mode exits more than 2.3 E-foldings before ultrasterol, it basically doesn't yeah. take the effect of it. Yeah. All right, thank you. Clear. Uh, yeah, very good. Yeah, you're very awake, thank you. Great. Yeah, so now I'm going to assume 3.5 e-folding, so inflation not immediately after the CMB scales exited, that would actually be a problem, thanks for that question, but uh, just at some point, and now we have slow roll, and then this number of e-folds at some point, what will happen, okay? So then the power spectrum of R, just slow roll is 3.5, this will equal P, CMB um, times e to the six and not just by roll. So it's ten to the minus nine times you know e to the six times three point five. And if you plug it in, you'll see this becomes order unity. So we need some ultra slow roll for primordial black hole production, but you cannot have too much. This leads to a thermal inflation. So we, you know, an ultra slow roll, at least assuming the initial amplitude is 10 to the minus 9, but to avoid that, you need somehow multiple periods where the power spectrum first decreases by a lot and then increases by even more. We typically need an ultra slow roll less than about 3.5. To avoid eternal inflation. And though that doesn't mean you can get up to this, because typically, at least on most scales, you will overproduce primordial black holes. So then PBH is more like. 2.3, it can be a bit more, it can be 2.5. Um, but because of this exponential growth, you know, it really can't be much more than this. And again, I'll justify the values that the power spectrum should be 10 to the minus 3 or 10 to the minus 2 on Thursday. So there are any Questions about that. Now that is a form of fine tuning, I'll admit. Okay, you know, we you need an inflection point for just slow roll. There's no reason a priori why your interplanet potential should have an inflection point. Then you must be careful that your inflection point doesn't last, you know, you don't get stuck in it. You don't want to have more than about three folds of ultra slow roll, otherwise the infraton field will simply lose all its kinetic energy and get trapped and you'll go into a tonal inflation. If you have too little, on the other hand, the power spectrum will grow, but not by very much, and that won't lead to primordial black hole um, being produced. And tutorial two with Pepper will be about this on um, Thursday. Okay, so I'll be making much more explicit the link for inflation to primordial black hole production. How can you do this more, you know, really properly and also really rigorously answer the question Fabio asked about, yeah, the behaviour of the different modes? Well, normally you would need numerics, and that's far from trivial. So numerics, you would, step one would be to solve the background. So by background, I mean phi of t, a of t, epsilon h of t, and okay. So you'd be solving the um, 
this equation of motion plus this one and some initial condition. And then you plug in your background solution into the mode equation. And you also have to do a matching to the bunch ladies or to the vacuum state of a simple harmonic oscillator valid on very small scales. And so you, you also need to apply the initial conditions because you can't solve it for the infinite range. And in fact, you need to know sort of what the, from quantum field theory or quantum mechanics, what the initial conditions are. Um, all of that's difficult, although there are publicly available codes, and one person I'll just advertise here, David Zero, has written one of these publicly available codes called um, CPP transports, which is a C, as the name suggests, code to simultaneously well, do both of these, solve the background and the perturbations. Um, however, even though that's available, A, it's not trivial to implement, and it can be, you know, time consuming, but also we don't get very much intuition from just finding numerical solutions. <clears throat> so you can get some analytic intuition. I'm only going to very, very briefly sketch a solution for some cases. For example, you can do matching calculations. So you can solve the equations for constant values of eta. Um, so you... so constant eta, remember that means the rate of change of epsilon in appropriate normalization is constant. And then you can match the solutions, matching both to the initial vacuum state, and then eventually you match to the super rising state. And once ultra slow roll inflation is over, you know that the modes will become constant. They'll become a conserved quantity on super rising scales when k uh, is going to zero. So you can match between analytic solutions where uh, these are different phases with constant values of eta. So the matching conditions, you know, I'm not deriving them. I'm just giving you a flavor of what goes into these sorts of calculations. Um, it's a second order equation, differential equation, so you get two matching conditions. The first one is that the metric perturbation or the curvature perturbation is continuous. Yeah, I don't think I can spell continuous. U O U S, maybe? Yeah, not sure. Um, so it's continuous across every matching, meaning when eta changes discreetly for an analytic simplicity, for example, between slow roll to ultra slow roll and then back to slow roll, this must be continuous because the metric uh, of GL must be continuous. And also from the equation of motion, one can find out that Z squared, which is proportional to um, A squared epsilon times the on formal time derivative drk tau is also continuous. Okay. This one comes from, yeah, the metric must be continuous, the other one from the equation of motion. And it's not simple, uh, you can solve analytically for constant eta in terms of the special functions, the Hankel functions. Then you can match, you have to be careful matching the two modes of your differential equation because you've always got two modes when you've got a second order differential equation, but eventually ultra slow roll ends, all the modes freeze out and you get a constant. Um, so I'm going to just show an example made by, um, by, made by Pippa using the code of David Series, CPP transport. So let me just give an idea. Um, it's one example. It's an example of an, a model of inflation with an inflection point, similar to the one I sketched by hand. Okay. So here we've got the power spectrum. <coughs> and it's on a log axis, so versus log k. <coughs> and let me first sketch, though, 
if it's better I sketch below so you can see them at the same time. This is going to be the value of um, the eta slurral parameter. Okay. So here is zero, and we know that during um, slow roll, eta is approximately zero. So we've got slow roll, then we're going to go into ultra slow roll, which means eta is minus six. And this, remember, can't last very long. And then back to slow roll. So we've got slow roll, and epsilon is small but constant. Ultra slow roll, epsilon is small and decreasing exponentially quickly. And then we go back to slow roll. Whoa. Oh, is that a question or a sneeze? And okay, now don't have different colored chalks. Okay, but this is now going to be the discrete case. So um, the simplest possible two-step matching. And what happens is that initially this is 10 to the minus 9. And here we've got about 10 to the minus 3-ish. This is just loose. So initially during slow roll, the modes are they immediately freeze out. H is constant, very nearly constant, so this is nearly constant. To match the CMB observations, it should very slightly decrease the scale. N is minus 1 is not 0, but it's close to 0. Okay, so nearly constant. Then, for reasons I can't go into, there's a dip, then there's a very rapid growth. And then there are some oscillations which are just purely an, an artifact of the um, matching calculation and then it freezes out. So you've got a little bit of a peak and then it freezes out again. Okay. That's what a matching calculation gives you. There's some weird sort of cancellation which happens actually a bit before the transition to ultra slow roll which is caused by the fact that um, yeah, that the modes which exit within about Two e folds of ultra slow roll, 2.3 e folds of ultra slow roll last for 2.3 e folds. We'll have both, first of all, the decay mode will decay, but then it will start growing again. And that can lead to a cancellation. Okay. And then, realistically, of course, inflation, you know, the inflaton potential presumably should be smooth, have a continuous best derivative. Um, so one finds something, yeah, sorry, I'm trying. Something like this, it really does hit the minus six, and then it sort of comes back up, and it can overshoot, can become positive. Here, when eta is positive, okay, eta greater than zero, this implies epsilon will increase, and typically epsilon will increase to become unity, and that defines the end of inflation. And then um, yeah, if I try to draw behind, basically everything will look the same, except there'll be no oscillation, so it'll just sort of smoothly do that. Okay. So if your numerical calculation, you have to be very careful because you have to track the exponential decay of the decay mode, but not let it become a rounding error and just be chopped by the numerics, because some of those modes will then become important again due to the exponential growth during ultra slow roll. Fortunately, ultra slow roll can't last too long, so you know there's a limit on how much precision you need to not lose track of it and then to see the exponential growth and then it freezes out when, ultra, when slow roll begins. Okay. So are there any, any questions about that? You know, I'm, I'm not trying to obviously derive all of these equations. I'm just trying to give you, again, a flavor of what they do and how they work. Uh, can I, I ask? Question. Sorry, sorry. No, you first. Uh, OK. Um, um, since ultra slow roll only lasts a short amount of time, I would have expected this enhancement in the primordial power to 
to happen all in a narrow range of scale. So mm -hmm. when we come back to a slow roll, I don't understand why, why we don't recover the 10 to the minus 9. This is ah. what I'm asking. Very good question. So um, ooh, can't push this up too far, but what happens then is, let me show you on the side. The reason is epsilon, now I'm going to show you epsilon h. Okay, so initially it's constant, or nearly constant, but then it decreases exponentially. So really this is log it, epsilon h versus n. Right? So it decreases by about a factor of a million. Then the point is it doesn't increase, at least not quickly. It will freeze out to be nearly constant at a much smaller value. And it may, you know, this is very rough. It may actually come down like that, but later, quite a bit later, or it may do, there are many things it might do, and, but typically it will then stay very small because we're back in slow roll and don't slowly grow. So this can all happen here to here is the duration of ultra slow roll. This thing can be 40, 30, 40 e folds as it grows again. I see. Okay. Okay. Um, Thank you. But is it, you're right. If if epsilon went back up here, then the power spectrum would come back down to the same value I had beforehand. Okay, but it takes a lot of time, right? Okay. Typically, yeah. So it depends. I mean, you can tune it to come back quickly, depending on if eta becomes large and positive instead. But that's not generically what we see. Mm -hmm. Okay. So someone else. I think I had a question. Yes, uh, I was wondering, do we have, uh, uh, is there a, a dynamical explanation of the fine tuning of n, uh, why it has to be two, three? I wish there was. <laughs> oh, okay. I wish there was, no, there isn't. I, I'm actually looking at this question again with uh, Hipper and Sabot, uh, with the last, yeah, the same authors as the paper I referenced at the beginning. Um, there may be arguments why an inflection point can happen when a, basically when a, a second scale, for example, a second particle present during inflation crosses from being lighter than to heavier than the Hubble parameter. So you could get some sort of something like a phase transition, which might create an effective um, inflection point. But so far, at least, there's absolutely no reason to know why it should be 2.3 e-fold in this duration. And I think it's better, I'm just honest, you know, that primordial black holes are a very unique candidate. They don't need new physics, but on the other hand, they do, there's no sort of weak miracle at all. You have to fine tune to get the right abundance. And typically you get either none or too many, and like exponentially too many. I see, thanks. Okay. You're welcome. Anyone else? If not, I'll show one last thing, um, because I have time, um, and on Thursday I know I'll be very busy, but I'll have a lot to show. So let me just justify why slow roll inflation itself will not give rise to crumbling black holes. Let me be a little bit more um, qualitative. Okay, so let's think about slow roll plus primordial black holes. Question mark. And so we need to be consistent that the power spectrum on sort of mega, inverse megapass set scales or larger should be 10 to the minus 9. Just to order of magnitude, I'm not trying to, you know, it's really 2 times 10 to the minus 9, but who cares? And now we want the power spectrum to grow on some relevant scale. And um, again, I'll only be able to justify why on Thursday, but a particular scale of interest for PBH production is 10 to the 16 inverse megaparsec. Why? Basically because this physical scale, uh, well, 
actually kill medium scale corresponds to um, a horizon mass which corresponds to a primordial black hole mass which would be evaporating today and there was a question in the office hour yesterday about that 511 keV line that would be a primordial black holes decaying today so this is a very very small scale 16 orders of magnitude smaller than we observe so can we produce this uh, primordial black holes on this scale which means we need this to be a pbh of order 10 to the minus 3. And, and I'm going to assume now, so plural implies PR is approximately, not exactly, but approximately AS K. So I wrote yesterday of a K pivot to the NS minus 1. So what I can do now is take the ratio of these two power spectra, take the ratio of the scales. As I said, k-pivot, it's like a, it's sort of like a dummy index or a dummy variable. Like you choose it to be in the center of the observations, but really it doesn't matter. The three parameters are the amplitude and the spectral index n is minus one. And when n is equal to one, of course, you've got exact scale invariance, because then k does not matter anymore. So which value of the spectral index would we need? So we've got PR inverse mega parser 10 to the 16 inverse mega parser again large values of K correspond to small physical scales this thing is so this is 1 over 10 to the 16 and that's minus 1 which must be um, 10 to the minus 6 to form primordial black holes. Okay, because we need this enhancement by six orders of magnitude. So you can take the logarithm of both sides, it's not difficult to do. Um, or simply balance the powers. So you need ns minus 1, would be 6 over 16, this is 0 0.4. Okay, which is not. Now, this is not much, much less than one. So this is the problem. In slow roll inflation, the slow roll parameter should be much less than one, not order one. Then the spectral index will be much less than one. So in order to form primordial black holes, we need a rather large value of the spectral index, at least for some range of scales. This was being, you know, assuming it would grow for as long as possible from this the smaller scale where we really observe the amplitude of the perturbations very well could be 10 to the minus 9 and it needs to grow quite quickly too quickly to be consistent with slow roll so i'll finish just with one plot just to hopefully make uh, clear and then um, yeah we need to finish on time so just yeah. Once again, power spectrum of R over OK. So again, CMB scales, we know there's actually a slight tilt to become smaller as you move towards larger K, smaller scales. And this is the inverse megaparsec. And then we had a growth by um, K to the 0 0.4 for a long time. So this is really very difficult to engineer right up to um, 10 to the minus 3, yeah, from 10 to the minus 9, where this is 10 to the 16 inverse magnitude. Okay. So A, this is not slow roll, and B, you know, this long continuous growth, uh, it doesn't really make sense at least to use a constant spectral index when the spectral index is far away from being scale invariant, doesn't really make sense it's unlikely to be a good approximation and so it seems more likely if single field inflation did generate primordial black holes it would rather be something like this which then had that dip and the peak grows much more quickly and then does something different not a continuous steady slow growth and i'll finish with that at one time 
So are there any questions before? Before tomorrow, I think tom tomorrow I'll, I'll use slides to show some pictures, introduce primordial black holes more generally, and then we'll get back to the blackboard on Thursday. Maybe everyone wants lunch. So maybe Chris, mm -hmm. I have a question for you. Oh. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, I just want was no, no, I just just also to 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 stimulate maybe the students. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the estimate that you uh, just made, uh, uh, maybe already you commented uh, on this, but uh, but uh, is based on on the fact that you are assuming a, a, a scalar spectral index which is constant, right? Yes. Which does not depend on scale. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Right. So uh, I mean, uh, is there the possibility to have a? a, 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 a a quite non-trivial uh, scale dependence on the spectral mm -hmm. index and still uh, reach the values of, of the curvature power spectrum to, 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 to produce primordial black holes? Um, I mean, it depends, I think, exactly how we define slow roll. For sure, you can get a scale dependence of the spectral index uh, from the higher order slow roll parameters, so you can do that. And that's fine. Um, but to make the power spectrum grow by orders of magnitude means that somewhere along the line, some of your slow roll parameters must be much larger than, say, 10 to the minus 2. Now, they can be 0 0.1. 0 0.1 is fine. Now, you know, I think it's up for debate if you can, can consider that slow roll or not. You certainly don't need ultra slow roll. But I'm rather arguing that the standard slow roll is really n is minus 1 is much less than unity. Sorry, much less than one. Yeah, much less than one. Uh, ultra slow roll very quickly grows enough uh, to get in between a, it's possible, but rather difficult. And yeah, I wouldn't really call it slow roll. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Okay. Well, I think maybe I should. So we're doing an interview soon. So. <laughs> I think I should stop. Remember, there's still an office hour and a tutorial to come, so there'll be plenty more chance for questions. Okay, okay. Um, yeah. Th th so, thank uh, you, Chris. Yeah, so we can, we can stop here. Right.